Now, the rest of the pride, what have you spotted? Now, here's the impala. You see, I think they were just snorting because they smelt the lines. Now, I know everyone is wondering and worrying about what the animals will do during the storm. You probably find it's not their first storm, uh, and they've been out in the bad weather before in their lives. So they will do what most of the animals do. They will hunker down. Um, and you know what? Lions, leopards, hyenas, and some of the other predators might even take advantage of the chaos caused by the storm uh, to catch the poor impalas and zebras that the tearing is going to be compromised. Of course, in the height of the storm, if the winds do get upward of 120 kilometers an hour, they will probably find a nice bush to lie under. Um, sorry, Orbs just asked me about the crocodile. If I'm a Goripan, Bovozuk, Dam, and then he, I think he's Kaimanzi, must be. So I think he's, that's the only place where there's still catfish. So Aubrey was asking me about Boris the blade, the crocodile that we tracked through the bush on foot the other day and we found hiding under a bush. Uh, he's moved off and uh, he's crossed our northern boundary into Buffles Hook and I think there's one large water hole there that's still got some catfish that'll keep a Boris sated so he has, can stop chomping on poor terrapins and leave the terrapin chomping to Votomi and Hosanna. There's probably no terrapins left for poor Hosanna. Boris the blade's eaten them all. Greedy guts. So I think these lions are so hungry that we're going to sit here um, we'll think, decide whether we're going to go back to the leopards or stay with the lions. But while we do that, Jamie is looking into the eye of the storm. I think I would have to have very, very good eyesight to look right towards the eye of the storm. But we do have a really, a truly beautiful view across the open area looking across Juma, across to where James is on Cheetah Plains, right at the end of that rainbow, and the steady bank of clouds that is coming in from the east. And I can't quite work out if it's because I know, because of all of the internet articles and the various wind maps I've been watching and the satellite pictures, I can't work out if the eerie feeling that I'm feeling is because I know something's coming, or if there is an instinctive... I don't quite know how to explain it. Um, an instinctive recognition of the danger that a storm like this would pose. Uh, do you know what I mean? I could sort of try and explain it. L I don't know. We know that animals are famous, of course, for knowing about storms and earthquakes and tidal waves ahead of time. And I don't. I think that we are generally have lost our perceptive abilities in terms of our our sense of hearing and smell and so on. But I do think that we've got. If we are able to pick up in changes in pressure. And of course wind always makes human beings uncomfortable because that's instinctively what we would have been when we were living wild out here. But it really is, there's an eerie, eerie feeling and this cloud is huge, this bank of clouds. And there's places where there is just a wall of water, like over, over towards the northeastern corner of Torchwood. I don't know whether or not you can actually see it or it comes across, but over the northeastern corner of Torchwood there is just a wall of rain that extends all the way over what must be the western edge of Kruger, I think. And as for that rainbow, it's beautiful, but it looks a lot like there's rain pouring down from it. That is utterly beautiful. Right, we just found an antlion. Shame. Let me try and put him down. Here's an antlion, a gorgeous, gorgeous antlion, but he's still very much alive. So I'm going to pop him over there. There we go. There we go. Isn't that utterly gorgeous? Sorry, I had to dodge the jaws for a second because he was about to bite me. But that is an absolutely, truly beautiful antlion. That's one of the most beautiful giant antlions I've seen. That is the 
adult form of those tiny little conical pits that we see in the ground. Gorgeous. Sorry, buddy. It's okay. All right. We're going to keep staring at the rainbow and actually, to be honest, make our way a little bit closer to camp. While we do, let's go and have a look from one view of a sky to another. That, everybody, is the ominousness that Jamie was talking of, but it's staying far to the east, so I'm not too worried about it yet, and nor is Gerald the cheetah. Don't worry, that's not his name. I just thought I'd, you know, get Twitter all a flutter that I'd named a cheetah Gerald, Gerald after we'd named, of course, a leopard Bigglesworth. You know, it might actually be time to name these cheetahs at some stage, so we'll probably have to have a talk about that, because we do like to name all our characters. And, um, what was that, Rebecca? Charlemagne. You want to call this cheetah Charlemagne, do you? Right, OK, well, Rebecca's suggestion for naming this cheetah is Charlemagne. Of course, the great French emperor, Charlemagne, who was operating when about, was he? He must have been round about, oof, 1100s? Maybe 1200s? 1100s. I'm not sure why you'd want to call him Charlemagne, though. I'm not sure that that's a good cheetah name. Charles, perhaps better. <laughs> Charles the Cheetah. <laughs> Charles the Cheetah and his brother Andrew. Look at that sky. Well, Chaz. Chaz and Charles. The Cheetahs of Cheetah Plains. Chase and Chad, the Cheetah, <laughs> Rebecca says, Chase and Chad, Cheetah Brothers for Life. Except they're not doing very well at being Cheetah Brothers for Life at the moment. He's not, he's much more relaxed than he was, and I'll tell you why I think that is. I think it's because he's lying in a totally open area now. So you can see he's given himself a little bit of vantage by lying up on the top of the bank of this um, water hole, I suppose you call it. And that just lets him see over the tops of the grass. And what's interesting here, everybody, if we just pan around the clearing here, if you don't mind, uh, Davy, you can see there that it is much greener than it is at Juma. Now, we're not far from Juma. We're probably, as the crow flies, about seven miles or so, so really not very far. This is how isolated the rain is in this area. I'd say this has received probably twice the rain that Quarantine Clearings has, and look at the length of the grass. Now, I'm afraid I've forgotten the name of the person who's last sent through, who sent through a question, so I'm sorry about that, but it will come back to me. Holly, there we go. Holly, you want to know about these cheetah and whether or not they greet in the same way that leopards do. They do, but it's not quite as affectionate. It's interesting. It's, uh, I noticed that the last time I saw the two brothers together, Holly, um, what they do is it, there is a greeting. There's a kind of head rubbing that goes on, but there isn't that... Uh, mutual grooming, that licking that goes on, even between male lions that you see, and they don't kind of flop onto each other like male lions do or like a lion pride does. They then lie apart from each other. They move with each other all the time, they lie close by, but they don't lie on each other the way lions do, or the way those two little leopard cubs have been doing. And I don't really know why that should be the case, but they're not quite as affectionate. They are, of course, a totally different genus, and while we, they are defined as part of the big cats, of course they are cats, and they are big, and therefore they are big cats, they are not closely related to leopards or lions. And you can see that because of that, they have slightly different behaviours. They don't behave in the same way that the panthera cats behave. 
and I've always thought, you know, all their adaptations, remarkable as they are for speed and for being able to maintain speed and use the muscles and the oxygen that they have to, for me, and I know this is a kind of random, it's not random at all, but it, for, it's the, possibly for many the least impressive adaptation they have, that ability to lie with their heads cocked to the side and relax and sleep, I think is remarkable. I don't know of another animal that's able to do that. And as I've said to you before, you just give it a try. You lie down on the on your side and try and cock your head up so that it's 90 degrees to your shoulders and see how comfortable you, or how long you can maintain that for. It won't be longer than two minutes, I promise. And it's because they have to be able to see what's going on around them. That's why he's chosen to lie where he has. He can look over the tops of the grass and they are so threatened and apparently this chap was set upon by some baboons this morning and although he wouldn't have struggled to outrun them or anything else out here for that matter he would like to see them coming, he needs a bit of early warning can't climb a tree in the same way that a leopard can certainly not to a point of safety anything that he can climb, anything that can, would chase him would be able to climb much better Right, we're going to go from one flat cat under the rainbow to another flat cat under the watchful gaze of Brent Leo Smith. Well, a very flat cat, even though they are quite hungry, I think they might get moving quite early this evening, but I'm in a, it is your game drive after all, so let me know, would you like to go back to the leopards or would you like to stay with the two Inkahuma ladies uh, and you can do that by sending me a, an email to questions at wildearth.tv or you can use the hashtag safari live on Twitter. Now, it's been quite a while so oh, I saw the Inkahumas very briefly on the boundary when all the lionesses were there um, but they dashed into Simbambili quite quickly and then they came back and dashed straight through Juma back into uh, Bufalsuk and then they've been up in the north so I wonder, it looks like she might have been mating. Brian was saying he could see some scuff marks around her neck. Well, it could be from mating. Could also just be from ticks. <laughs> Sean is wondering, are the lionesses ear tops bald like the leopards? They can become bald like the leopards, Sean. Uh, if you notice the young cubs, they do not have bald ear tops. It is from biting flies, a fly species called the stable fly that attacks uh, their ears profusely. So that is why the ears become bald and a bit scraggly. Now, of course, if you had to have a competition for the champion napper, it would be the lion, average about 20 hours a day. And let's just try, sorry Brian, let me move around a little bit. Vanessa would like to know, do all big cats hunt better in cooler temperatures? Indeed they do. Uh, their body is able to cope better. And uh, so I wouldn't say they hunt better, they, they hunt more frequently. Uh, there's shorter downtime uh, while they cool down, while it's cold. And all the big cats hunt better in stormy, windy weather. So if it's raining and storming, uh, it really takes away a lot of the advantages that some of the prey species might have uh, to defend themselves against the the prey I mean against the predators so it's always better in stormy and windy weather how's that here we go now I don't I think it's still too hot I think we really we want to be with them what what is the time now Brian 
quarter to six. Oh, we want to be with them probably at about half past six uh, as it really cools down a bit uh, to see if they get up and on the move. Answer a bit of action might be around those little leopards. So I am still waiting to hear, but Brian and I, I think we vote leopard, then yeah. back to lion. That's our that's our call, but we will we will wait for you to decide. Remember, if you want to tell us, would you like to go back to the leopards or stay with the lions? Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or pop. Oh, there we go. You have decided you want to go to the leopards. So we're going to go back to the leopards, guys. And uh, we will try to get back to these lions at about half past six, quarter to seven. That's when they're likely to get moving. They are really, really hungry. But while we do that, let's go back to Jamie, who's still playing with grass. I'm definitely not playing with grass. I'm striding through grass to make sure that we're a little bit closer to home. Brent seems quite confident that this rain isn't going to hit us before the end of the sunset safari. I'm not so sure. Look, most of it's blowing off to the north and it actually hasn't come that much closer to us. But now here on the open area of quarantine, it feels a lot more on top of us than it did earlier. So we've actually, we haven't even had time to really stop and find anything to show you. We've just been marching through the grasses to try and get ourselves a little bit closer to home just in case the wind does turn and of course that's the unpredictable thing about weather like this is the weather could change direction at any moment there are that's solid walls of rain in front of us and of course the added I've just seen a few forks of lightning as well which is an added risk so we're just lurking close to home we of course don't have a set of wheels, so if the heavens do open on us, we would have to run back home. And I don't feel like doing that on this hot, humid afternoon. I don't feel like a casual jog through the bush. And if I don't feel like a casual jog through the bush, well, I can tell you that Viam with his 15 kilogram backpack most definitely does not feel like a jog through the bush. So we've made sure that we avoid it by coming right into the middle of quarantine so that if it is coming, we'll be able to jump out of the way as quickly as possible. Whew. Grass is still long here. Not green, but still long. And then of course all of these little baby silver cluster leaf bushes all growing up around here. And that to me is not necessarily just seep line indication. That's actually, that's encroachment. Now the balance of the clearings of quarantine has been upset in some way, whether through a lot of excess of grazing or perhaps feeding off the trees. Hmm. Now Naomi, you want to know how, did, sorry, did I hear that right? Spear grass grows or just other grasses? It is spear grass, okay. You want to know how spear grass grows. It grows, I would love to show you, and this is just the wrong place for spear grass. It grows basically upwards. Essentially all of the threads of the spear grass seeds are wound, initially wound together really, really tightly in a kind of a spiral that ends in a very sharp point. So does that make sense? They kind of wound like this, but so tightly that you actually can barely see, you, you can't really differentiate one part of the seed to the other. And then what happens when that seed starts to get to the point where it's ripe and it's ready for distribution. Let me just try and show you. It's black, by the way, the spear grass seeds or the, spe the spear grass wings of the dispersal. So what happens is when this it doesn't quite look like this, but just imagine that this is in a point at the end. But when it is ripe, it starts to unravel and it kind of comes out in these filament hair type mechanisms, very much like, what is the word I'm looking for, for this grass? Oh, the tassel, the tassel three on grass this sort of grass. It, it spreads out like that and it catches in the animal's fur. 
in the animal's fur on their legs and so on. But if you get it, spear grass is great fun. If you get it at the right time, before it's got to that splitting, it unravels, almost like it was s s sprung in some way. But once you get it when it's un before it's unraveled, you can actually spend many an amusing hour, depending on who you are. My, my entertainment usually runs out at about three minutes in, but you can throw it at people and it sticks in their clothing. It's great fun. I have known people, without mentioning any names, I have known people to be amused by it for at least an hour at a time. I generally find that my entertainment is slightly shorter lived with something like that. But you never know what might keep different people entertained. Double rainbow. It's not even a single rainbow anymore. It's a double rainbow. Still blowing straight past us, you know. Going straight north. I almost feel snubbed. It's exactly what's happened with all of the storms. Okay, so it's hit James. It's hit James. It is a wall of water. I think it's coming. I think it's still coming. The whole of last year, the rain would build and then blow off to the north of us and not land upon us. <laughs> you all are wondering, if we did have to do a mad sprint through the bush, um, which of us would carry what equipment? It depends how fast we'd have to do it. I mean, I'd be more than willing to offer Vildi a bit of help with carrying the pack if we had a long way to run, but probably what would happen is I would have the, the camera wrapped in a black bag, we'd have the cover over the walking pack, and we'd be on the radio to one of the other ladies or gentlemen in DRC, which is our main camp, to say, please come and bring a vehicle and come and rescue us, rather than making us run home in the rain. But if we had to run, I would probably take the camera, wrap it in a black bag, and Herbie would be sprinting with his rifle and his backpack on. Now, I've heard that it's raining upon James. He is very, very brave staying where he is, right on the eastern side, but he does have a good reason to, because he's still with that cheetah. Look at this picture everybody, there is a bit of rain coming out of the sky, there's a rainbow, there's a cheetah, there's just gorgeousness everywhere I look. David is just going to wipe the lens on the count of the rain. I've put my camera away, put my binoculars away, I've donned this utterly ridiculous and entirely pointless poncho for the sake of it. Have you ever designed this should be dragged out into the street and mauled? Hang on, I can't drive. Right, here we go. <laughs> David finds the state of this poncho very amusing for some reason. I think there's a brief squall. I don't think it's the eye of the cyclone pulling up over the top of us. There's still lots of very beautiful sun, and it's all coming from there, and it looks pretty clear above us. So I think we'll be fine. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous sight. We've been sat here with this cheetah, the most stunning rainbow, and the sky changing to, dare I say it, 50 shades of grey. <laughs> in an infinitely more appealing fa man manner than E.L. James managed. See, David, the cyclone has passed us by. It's the fourth cyclone we've had today. Oh, and just look at that rainbow. Just too magnificent, hey? <laughs> Rachel, you say it's absolutely stunning. Well, I'm not sure that there's a better way to describe it. I'll tell you what, why don't you all try? Hashtag Safari Live. You can give us two words this time. You may use, like Rachel did. 
absolutely stunning if you'd like. Well, you can't do that. That's already been taken by Rachel. But you can give us any other two words to describe the scene that we have here. A cheetah, a cyclone on the move in a giant rainbow, which was a double rainbow. For, oh, it's still a double rainbow if we look off to the left there. And some golden softening afternoon light here. Now I'm going to attempt to follow this fellow down through the bush. I think that he will probably pop out eventually on the clearings. But cheetah, quite unlike their more fancied or uh, more seen cousins, the leopards, they quite prefer to move through the bush like this. They don't like to be on the open, on the game paths in the same way. Now just excuse the noise that's going to happen now. Neither from my swearing. Oh gosh, I can't see anything. David, where are we? Okay, sorry about that. My microphone is in my hat, everybody. Okay, we'll keep going. I've lost the cheetah. Shut up, Rebecca. <laughs> Ooh, can you see them? Hello, Courtney. Oh, there he is. Courtney, you've asked a lovely question about how societies dedicated to the preservation of cheetah and such creatures are going to actually benefit them in the wild and what they're trying to achieve. Are they trying to achieve genetic diversity or what is it? Um, Courtney, uh, yes, to a certain extent there would be an attempt to preserve some form of genetic diversity. I don't think that that's really very possible here because, of course, we know that Cheetahs have inescapably narrow genetics because, of course, they all come from the same... Ooh, we may get into a very horrible fix here. Um, because they all come from the same female, eventually, from one bottleneck. Oh, here's a nice game path. Just as I was saying, you see, cheetah hate to be on game paths, David. Um, and... <laughs> The big thing for them, as with just about every single other species there is on Earth, is to maintain their habitat. We have to maintain habitat that they can live in. Now that includes protected areas, it includes non-protected areas. There's a huge amount of work being done in Namibia, for example, where there are not a lot of people. And because of the sparse population of human beings, what you find is that there are vast swathes of land that have cheetahs in them, but they aren't protected. And so hunters and farmers who don't necessarily understand the benefits of having a cheetah around the place uh, or their plight as a species will sometimes shoot them. And I mean, I know that's astounding to hear. There's a giraffe up ahead. So it very much focuses on maintaining a place for them uh, through not losing any more habitat and educating people about them. You know, uh, the thing with animals like this is that they have verged on extinction more than once. Rhino, the same kind of a thing. And eventually they will go extinct. Or eventually the climate will change to the extent that their habitat changes and they actually start to outcompete predators like leopards and lions. Difficult to understand what kind of conditions that would take place in. But eventually all species will go extinct because of or be replaced by other better adapted species because of course the niches that they occupy will change. And so I think for all species out here, we just have to maintain their habitat. And in a place like the Sabi Sands, for me, what's very important is that we tinker as little as possible. So we don't provide too much in the way of artificial water and that sort of thing, because that will change the delicate balance of what has allowed this cheetah to survive in this area for this long. There are two giraffe off there. He still keeps looking behind him. That giraffe is now watching the cheetah. God, what a wonderful sighting. Gee whiz, we've been lucky today. Let's carry on. Sorry, David, I missed your half key there, didn't I? It's because I've been in the tent so long. I'll explain what I mean now, everyone. See, now when, when David is 
zoomed in on an animal like this here. I'll quickly demonstrate it for you if you like. There's the there is the cheetah walking through there now. David is super zoomed in on where the cheetah's gone. He's in there. Just if you super zoom in there, he's in there. See now if I just start the engine and start driving, you will get seasick. And so what I'm supposed to do is just turn the key like that, then he zooms out and then we move forward. Okay, while we follow this cheetah through this bit difficult area, let's head across to Karula and Brent Leo Smith. Oh, welcome back, and yes, we are now with the Queen, and uh, she's doing the same thing the lions were, having an afternoon snooze in the shed, fighting off the biting flies. So she's probably about 400 meters from where we found Hosanna and Shongile, taking a bit of me time. Asana is getting quite rambunctious with her, and she occasionally does have to discipline him. Dowd is wondering, are the leopards afraid of lions, and how far away are they from each other? They most certainly are afraid of lions, and probably about just over a kilometer from where this leopard is to the lions and probably about 700 meters from where the other leopards are uh, her cubs to where the lions are oh those flies obviously irritating her you can see if we look carefully oh look at all of them evil little stable flies you can actually see a bit of blood that's been drawn Brian, was that a raindrop that hit me up? Yeah. And again, and another one. Where? We have blue sky above us. Oh dear, Deneo is on the way. Brian and I were actually just discussing Deneo in depth. And, uh, And then, I don't think, I think this is just going to be a little sprinkle. I don't think we need the rain covers. But, uh, so there we go. There is Deneo. That little green circle. It's poor little old ass. And uh, she's moving westwards at about 11 kilometers an hour. And uh, gusting winds of up to 120 kilometers an hour and uh, other winds, normal winds, of 100 kilometers an hour. So you can actually, if we zoom in here, you can see there's the, obviously the eye, but you can see this weather that we're getting and the, these clouds and, and this wind, it's right, we're right on the edge of, the, of, of that wing, that circular uh, wind of, oh, sorry, of Deneo, what Deneo is catching. So I think this is what we're gonna get next. And there's quite a bit of rain in that but it's still a little bit off. We just got this very light dusting. So that big cloud James is looking at, I'm pretty sure, is that, whoopsie, is that one there. And it says inside that one, there's about five mils of rain, so not too much. Um, and the wind is doing 16 kilometers an hour, but if you pop your finger onto the edge of Deneo's eye, there we go, 88 Ks, 108 Ks. Scary. Oh, sounds like those lines are up. So, should we go back to them quickly? Karula's flat. And anyway, the person who's the most in danger of getting drenched today is most certainly James Hendry. Okay, Woo. now 23 to 30 kilometers an hour is strong wind for this part of the world, for normal. I mean, I'd probably say some of the strongest wind we've had this year is 30, 35. Uh, 100 kilometers an hour is gonna be serious. Um, there's going to be a lot of broken branches. 
a lot of fallen down trees and who knows we might even see the Mawati flowing have you ever seen the Mawati flow Brian? I haven't. No me neither I'm not so excited to see it flow. Uh, I have, um, I've dealt with the storms uh, of this magnitude before in, in other places in Africa and it's all very exciting, the lead up to them. But uh, about an hour in, the fun and excitement are, are, are over. <laughs> there's no electricity, um, there's no cell phone signal, there's no internet, um, you're cooking over a Bunsen burner, uh, uh, eating a tin of beans, uh, you've got to worry about all your, your meat and stuff in deep freezers, your vegetables, and I mean it's, it's actually, it's, it's quite a serious thing and that's why we've been preparing quite heavily. Uh, and we all thought, ah, it's going to miss us, you know, we'll be fine. Steph's deluge, Steph being paranoid. Don't ever tell Steph, but I think he might have been right. Just he was about four months off. <laughs> now, of course, it's going to change the dynamic of the game viewing quite a lot. Because with a lot of water, all the water holes full, lots of grass everywhere. Now it all depends, so we've got very little grass cover even from the rains we've had this year. So we might lose a lot of the topsoil, so we might not actually have that much grass for the winter. But only time's going to be able to tell. The buffalo will be upset, the lions will be happy. <laughs> So there we go. It's going to be a very interesting couple of days and of course uh, I know we have forewarned that if we are getting beaten down here uh, by Deneo we will probably not be able to produce a live safari uh, even from the tent. We, we've got to take all that stuff out of the And amber eyes on the move. You can see how hungry they are. Uh, if they get onto Twin Dams and they head straight north on Twin Dams, they might run straight into Karula. Just trying to see where Amber's going. is massive clouds coming so that big cloud that spat on us a little bit has actually dissipated and the next big one is quite far off what time do you reckon we're gonna have heavy rain tonight I say 11 yeah I say around 12 oh. midnight 1 o'clock oh look at that wound on her side of her head that's a bite oh she's so close to us Hello big girl. Oh, can you believe when I started here, she was about seven months old. She was very visibly a cub, about the same age as those cubs are now. Now look at her. Oh, lions, you got me all excited to flop down again. I think we need to get that sky behind them, Brian. What do you think? Get ready for the screenshot bonanza of lions and stormy skies. Share them with us using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or pop them on our Facebook page or in many of the other groups uh, where people share their beautiful screenshots. We obviously don't want to be screenshotted with the sky. Do you, Amber? <laughs> She's on the move. Oh dear, we're downwind, Brian. Don't breathe. I'm moving. Hold your breath. Hold your breath. Quickly. Ah. Oh, 
<sighs> we're upwind, it's okay now. We can breathe again. Oh, hello. I love lion greetings. Oh, they both look like they've actually been in a fight. And so both of them have a couple of scars on them. I wonder if they ran into the sticks. Or it could just be from turning away the Birmingham boys, of course. But they are looking very, very hungry. We thought they might get moving a little earlier. And luckily for the them we haven't seen any lone buffalo bulls today along this area. What have you seen or heard behind you? Yes there we go you can see that wound a little bit there that definitely looks like a bite mark to me that's a tooth that's gone in there. It's tough being the apex predator arch yeah? Oh, you know what she's looking at, I think. Someone was looking at her tracks crossing the road. I think someone on the on the boundary saw the lion tracks and got out to have a look at them and she spotted them. There's two on Satyangala are now mobile north on Twin Dams Road. Yeah, well, we're going to keep following the... In, well, a portion of the incredible Incahomas, but let's go see what Jamie's up to on foot. What a lovely surprise the incredible Incahomas were, turning up when we least expected them. I'm hoping that the particular creature that I really wanted to show you will do the same thing. Since all of the rain has blown past us, it rained on us for about two seconds and then promptly went on its way. And now I can only see blue skies and more rolling waves of cloud. So I guess that's just how it's going to be over the next few days, just rolling thunderstorms. Now, Taylor told me about this little secret, and well, Taylor and Veerman Herbie actually, that they discovered yesterday afternoon on their bushwalk, and it is a baboon spider hole, obviously, but with the added advantage of tiny little baby baboon spiders in it. And I don't think that any of you will have seen, I don't know whether or not you got to see it with Taylor, or did the batteries die beforehand? Yeah. Unfortunately, the batteries of the backpack died before she was able to show you. So, I'm going to try and show you myself. Unfortunately, now they are playing very, very shy. Which is a pity, because baboon spiders are my absolute favorite spiders. I love them. And to see all of the little ones was a true treat indeed before they all dashed into their burrow. Well, not their burrow. I don't think the burrow is the right word. Hole. I'm just trying to see whether I can see any of them, but it doesn't look like it. Um, no. They've really disappeared far in. There was a whole load of them. I, I suspect they're baby baboon spiders, but I'm not 100% sure because I didn't actually fully see them. I haven't had a chance to really fully examine their shape, so it might not be baby baboon spiders. It is a, a baby baboon, a baboon spider type hole. It's definitely that style, surrounded by silk. Down, straight down. Oh, I feel like I'm gonna go sliding down the damn wall. I'm definitely slowly shifting, or the soil is slowly shifting underneath my feet. But it's definitely the right style, but unfortunately, it doesn't seem as though they want to come up and say hello to us, which is a pity. I want to do some research though, and into whether or not there are any types of spiders that will acquisition a baboon spider's hole. Now Marlene, you want to know if they are poisonous. Did I hear that correctly? Uh, this one. Pardon? This one. You got one. I can't see it. I can't see it. No. Shall I shift the torch slightly? Yeah, fine. Got it. Can you still see it? I can't see it, but I'm going to take your word for it. Wait, let me do this not move the light too much. There it is. There's the little arachnid we've been looking for. 
doesn't quite look hairy enough to be a baby baboon spider, but perhaps. I don't actually know much about baby baboon spiders full stop. It is definitely, there's definitely a whole load of them. Um, the question about whether or not they are poisonous. The answer is no, they're not poisonous. Although it's important to remember the distinction between poison and venom, of course. So Marlene, if, if you're thinking whether or not Ooh, they would... There's a big one. There's a big one. Yeah. A big one like a big baboon spider or a big baby? No, a big baby. Okay. Just see them starting to come out. I still can't quite properly. Oh, 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 there comes the baboon spider. How cool is that? She's coming out. Hello, mom. Are you coming to make sure we're not attacking your babies? Who knew baboon spiders were so motherly? This is amazing. You don't often get baboon spiders coming out of their own volition. This is really, really cool. She just came out straight away. Hi, girl. You are gorgeous. What happens if I take your light, the light off you a little bit? Will you come further out? How stunning is she? Meet the mother of the little ones. Sorry, Marlene, they're not poisonous. They're not venomous either. So poison is when you eat something and it is toxic to you. Venom is when something bites or sting you, stings you and injects venom. Aww. Aww. It's all right, girl. Sorry. That was my fault. I just shifted ever so slightly and she disappeared. Well, in that case, they must be baby baboon spiders because there's no way, surely, she would tolerate the company of any other types of spiders. Wow. That was very, very cool. I think that's the first time ever in my entire guiding career that a adult baboon spider has come out of its own volition. Now, Jeff Speed, good question. You want to know whether or not we'd use the endoscope camera to go into the hole. Jess, potentially, but not until we've had a chance to reinforce it ever so slightly so that we don't we don't have to kind of just poke it in and let it drop and tumble into the hole because that will damage the delicate silk lining. It's not like dropping a blade of grass down there, which does happen, or bits of sand or anything like that. Now, I wouldn't want to damage the lining of her silk burrow and certain species of baboon spider are that one's not but certain species are critically endangered and to interfere with them is a very unfortunate thing because once a baboon spider has established itself and dug itself a hole it won't ever dig another type of hole it won't ever dig, dig another hole i mean so the females will live in those holes their entire lives and if those holes are destroyed they won't ever move back into them and I'm afraid to say the rain has started up again. I'm not entirely sure where it's coming from, but it is raining upon us. So I might need to, we might need to rewrap the camera in its protective waterproof casing. But that was really, really, very cool. Look at the color of that sky. Quite eerie. Okay. All right, we're gonna quickly put our rain covers on. Let's go and have a look at Brent's lions who are up and moving. I wonder where Jamie is, because we're burned dry. Uh, we're still with the lines though, now started heading west. Oh, look at that. Now it gives you an idea how big those animals are. That's probably, that's taller than me, that she could reach up there. So they're nice and hungry, and that's why we had always planned to come back to the lions, because I'm pretty confident that they were gonna get moving, and they're going to hunt. There is some magnificent skies out at the moment. And just look at that. Ooh, oh, magic. So that temperature just dropped enough for these lions to get on the move. And as I said, they're really hungry towards quarantine.
Now this windy weather with these clouds rolling in is going to be excellent hunting weather for them. So hopefully they don't stay. Oh, itchy. And we stop when a lion's got an itch. I'm, I'm, it's feeling quite wi weird. I mean, when was the last time we followed a lion? Oh, she's seen something, she's seen something. The, the amber eyes have seen something. She's running, she's chasing something, she's going for the kill. She's just missed an Inyana. She's still going. The youngest lioness was sleeping. She got really close to that Inyala. Oh, there's Inyala. There's one running away. Oh, so close! That Impala just hit another gear. <laughs> wow. It was obviously Impala and Inyala there. And... Pandemonium. But it looks like they're both missed. But as I said, they're hungry. That's why we had to get to these lions. As soon as I heard they were on the move. That was, that was not far off. Now, I can't see Amber just yet. The last I saw her, she disappeared about where we are now. Ah, oh, there she is. So they're gonna join up again. Ooh, that was close and these girls are famished. There's Amber. And this wind is going to work in their favour, creating confusion. Now, hi Natalie, who's 11 years old. Natalie is wondering why lionesses don't have manes. Well, they don't fight as much for territory. So the male lions will fight a lot with other male lions and those manes help protect their throat and back of their head. Now, there's another reason, and it's also for fighting. If a, ma a male's got a really impressive mane, he could be able to dissuade another male from attacking him just by looking impressive. So that's why male lions have manes and the lionesses don't. Don't, don't, don't see animals that side. I don't know if I can get a car through here. Keep, keep, keep going towards quarantine. Good girls. Jezza says they seem very hungry and weak. Uh, well, hungry, yes, weak, no. Uh, but they're by no means starving. Uh, Jezza would also like to know whether they hunt at day or night. Well, they are preferably hunt at night, but this is the time of the day when they start getting moving and start hunting. And obviously it all depends on how hungry they are. And because they're very hungry, they've got moving a little bit earlier, but that's also because the wind and the cloud have come in and have cooled the area a bit. I think they thought they saw something on the other side of this little ravine from us, but I can't see anything there. Now, another cat that's favorite time of the day to hunt is at this dusk hour is the cheetah. So let's go see what's happening with a James and his cheetah. Live. 
Sorry, I'm just telling Davy that we're live there. He has, cannot hear the final control. There is a beautiful, beautiful sky. The cheetah is still underneath it. And I'm trying desperately to figure out one of the birds that we can hear while we watch the cheetah. It's going... And I don't know what it is. Any help would be greatly appreciated. I know I've heard it before, but I cannot remember what it is. There are lots of them around here. They've obviously just got in. Yeah, they're all over. Let me try this one here. <laughs> I just don't know what it is. So while we wait for the cheetah to do something, I'll play a couple of calls and see if we can't find what it is. It's not that. I can't think. But it's obviously a bird that moves in fairly large numbers. And it comes into areas, well, unusually and sort of randomly it's not that anyway we'll keep it going if anybody's got any ideas the cheetah thinking or is watching a herd of wildebeest and zebra and impala but he's full he's ate, eaten a little baby impala earlier today and so he's not in the slightest bit hungry, and that's why he's panting. It's not hot anymore. The temperature's probably dropped to around 75 degrees or so. Which is in... Mm -hmm, one second, everybody. Mm -hmm, yeah, about 25. It is 25. 25 degrees Celsius. Very nice wind blowing in from the southeast. And I suspect these birds have come in on the storm. Um, Anna Marie, uh, a good question from you. That you want to know if they metabolize their food faster than lions or leopards, or, and do they hunt more? Um, Anna Marie. I don't think they metabolize the meat faster necessarily. They do eat faster though. They will bolt their food as fast as possible because most of the time, probably 75% of the time, they will lose their kills. They will lose their kills even to vultures. And so that means that they grab at the hindquarters first. And it's interesting, I, I'm not entirely sure why they do that. People will tell you that the hindquarters can have some of the richest meat, but, you know, I don't think it's any richer than anywhere else on the body. And certainly it's, um, it's not as, as fat-rich or as nutrient-rich as some of the, uh, of the organs, which a cheetah generally doesn't go for unless it can right at the end. So they'll go in from the backside, they eat out the rump, the hindquarters first, and then they often lose their kills before they can eat anything else. He's obviously got very tired and decided that he'll probably remain there for the rest of the day. Now just remember it is of course International Hippopotamus Day and we did spend a lot of time with hippos at the beginning of the drive. We were going to go back there uh, sort of round about now to see if they didn't come out of the dam but then we kind of got stuck with these rather spectacular cheetah. With this spectacular cheetah, only one. Only one. And we spent a great deal of time with him today. Tristan had about two hours with him this morning. I can just hear the odd Swainson spur fowl making its call. And what we're going to do quickly, as we hand you over to Jamie, is quickly have a look at this big bank of clouds moving in here. I don't think we're going to be here for too much longer before we head back to Juma. You can just see a little bit of pink touching those clouds. Isn't that gorgeous? 
wonderful. Let us head back to Jamie Patterson and see what she has to say about the incoming deluge. Well, I must say that as ominous as the clouds have been this afternoon, it has provided for some really truly stunning scenery. Sorry, there was some birds alarm calling as I started speaking there. It's just been utterly exquisite with the banks of clouds building in. We can see, James has already showed you the second completely different looking bank of clouds that's now on its way in. And it's going to be, if nothing else, interesting to see the way that this all pans out. Personally, I don't think we're going to get that much water. We'll get some. I think we're going to get about, I don't know, I don't know why I'm saying this like I have any degree of expertise, 50 or so mils. Somehow it just doesn't feel like we're going to get lots of rain. But I think the wind is going to be intense and I think the storms are going to be intense and I think a lot of it's going to fall at one go. However, it is not for me to guess. I am not a meteorologist. I am, in fact, just a person, and as just a person, it is time for us to all go home as it starts to get dark. Not all of us, just those, the three of us that are on foot. Once it starts to get to this sort of light, it gets very, very difficult to, for human eyes to distinguish different shapes. It's actually that sort of grey light is very, very difficult. So we're going to head home. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to Viam for his wonderful camera work and thank you to Herbie who as always is our fantastic protector and thank you to all of you. We'll catch you on the sunrise safari. Bye bye everybody. Well we're with the lions. Oh sorry I've pulled out my ears. Um, thanks Brian. Brian let me know I, I was live there. Oh, you're catching up with me too fast Amber. I need to put some speed on. So we haven't had the chance to do this Brian and I love doing this. We get in front of the lines and we reverse while they walk towards us. Now we're heading up towards Treehouse Dam now. So we won't do it for too long, I'll just get to the dam. We, we drove around on the other road and we had a look. There was, unfortunately for the lions, fortunately if you're something else, uh, there were no animals at the waterhole. We need to take a shortcut now. Yes, you are. bounce bounce but we're in the right spot now lovely this is definitely going to suit them this weather that's moving in you saw how close they got to catching an impala and an inyana Coming up behind the dam wall, using it as if the same way they would use a termite mound, possibly. And pop their head over, make sure there's no potential prey on the other side. Unfortunately for them, I can tell them there is no potential prey on the other side. We were supposed to pass in front of the car. The wind is definitely getting a bit stronger. They're right behind us. Okay, let's go forward. Stopping for another drink. Oh, let's try to get onto the opposite side to them. What do you think, Brian? Hello. 
Little lions, thirsty kitties. Okay, well, while we get into position, let's go quickly across to James on Cheetah Plains. Right, we're going to leave this cheetah fairly soon, everybody. We're going to have one last look. David is convinced that the bank of clouds heading quite ominously from the southeast. I need a new word other than ominous. I shall find it in my thesaurus today. Um, but there it is, coming in in a, whatever word I'm going to use, fashion, it's coming in from the southeast there. And we're a bit worried that it might hit us. Ah, thank you, Leslie. Your two-word tweet for my sighting, breathtakingly beautiful. It was indeed breathtakingly beautiful. It remains so. Well, not anymore, because now you're looking at me. Let's go back to the cheetah for the last time. And then we're going to head out of here before that bank of cloud arrives. Ah, and Debbie, you say it's brilliantly ominous. Brilliantly ominous, yes indeed. Brilliantly ominous. The cheetah is not, of course, in the slightest bit ominous at all. He's rather splendid. I, I think he might sort of, um, I don't know, I think he's going to have a rough time if it gets too wet here. And he might stay here all night and just slip underneath that quarry bush to try and hide. Right. Lisa, you say it's spectacular. Very nice, Lisa, thank you. I found a word. Um, my word, instead of ominous, is going to be, I didn't think of this, it's on my, I've looked it up, uh, portentous. A portentous sky. Oh, it is very portentous. Cheetah is up, David. He's still watching that herd of zebra and impala moving off into Mala Mala. Now, he might hunt now. I mean, look, I say he won't because you can see him panting because his belly's so full. Let's just give him a few minutes before we head out of here. We don't want to be caught in this weather. He looks a bit sad not to have found his brother, I feel. But probably quite happy to have had a meal to himself. Isn't that lovely? Oh, we figured out what the bird was, with the help of Sean from Arethusa. The bird is the monotonous lark that we were hearing. The monotonous lark, and I read about it, and apparently it arrives in eruptions. Uh, sort of randomly, nobody really knows why, and I reckon it's arrived here because they've had a lot of rain on cheetah plains. That grass is long, there are going to be hundreds of insects around for it to eat, and so that's why I think a flock of them has arrived here on the plains de la cheetah that we can see right in front of us. All right, I'll just quickly give you a look at where those impala are. Sorry, David, I did it again. <laughs> All right, there are the impala. They're a long way away, utterly sort of uh, oblivious to the existence of this cheetah. That's a pretty big... That's about the prey size limit for a cheetah like this, and I think you'll find that given the number of baby cheetah around the place, while he'll look at them sort of wistfully, I think he'll probably let them go. They are in a great position, though, for a cheetah. There are bits and pieces of cover that during the night like this he might be able to sort of sneak his way towards them before we chased. Alrighty, we're going to wait here with him for a few more minutes in case he does something. If he doesn't, well, then we'll press on soon. In the meantime, Leo Smith is still with the Leos. <laughs> Well, I, indeed, the lions. Sometimes I'm referred to as Lion Smith. <laughs> I'm not even joking, that's how bad it is. But we're going to stick with them. <laughs> I'm not joking, that's cool. Lion Smith, come here. But yes, no. 
we're going to stick with them. As I said, I think they're our best chance at a possible hunt this evening. It feels like an age since I was on a lion hunt, isn't it? Exciting. They are taking us into a bit of a thicker area now. They might be looking for Kudu and Inyala. So we just... Yeah, we good. We good? Yeah. Cool. It's amazing how much the bush has thickened up. I mean, I, dro I remember driving through here not that long ago and we could go through without touching a branch. Oh, that was a thorn in my knee. Well, a small sacrifice to be on the hunt with two of the Enkahumas. And they're going to take us through the thickest area and then go straight back to the road. <laughs> Remember, hashtag Safari Live questions at wildearth.tv if you want to ask us questions about lions hunting or anything else for that matter around here. Now, they're checking this termite mound. There could very easily be a warthog hulk in here. And I have seen lions dig warthogs out before when they're very hungry. What has she found? As I said, there could be a, a warthog hole here. I just watch. Now, September says, you keep naming the individual lines. They look so similar. How do I tell them apart? Well, the one on the right with the top has got amber eyes. She's got reddish colored eyes. And the other one is a little bit more now moving towards her has a golden eyes that's hard to tell these two apart she's also the youngest female the other three females of this pride uh, are currently have cubs and they're to the north of where we traverse I, I, what has she got there let's go have a look I don't I'm trying to remember I've walked through this and I'm trying to remember if there is a, a warthog burrow here but it looks like there is there, there, oh, hold on Oh, pig! Go, pig! They're off to that pig! Oh, it's so close! It just got away! Wow! I said there was something there. I can hear the pig grunting in the distance. Now, she might go back and check because there's often more than one warthog in these burrows. That is a lucky warthog. <laughs> now, just for some of you who might be a little bit sensitive, if these lions do manage to catch something while, while we are with them, especially if it's something small uh, or something like a warthog, it can be very, very gruesome and very, very loud. So I'm just warning you, if you do get a bit sensitive, you might want to go get a cup of coffee or, uh, or, or something of the like. Now they're coming back to check this hole again. Let's just get around a bit. Now, as I said, there's often multiple warthogs in a single hole. I see what saved that warthog's life now. Watch the thorns there, Brian. This fallen tree is what saved that warthog's life because it came under, where's my arm? It came under here and the lions couldn't just, just couldn't get to it. That is one a very lucky pig.
Now I think if the pig had gone the other way, the lions would have been able to get to it. But he went from the hole there and then he went under that fallen branch. And that was very lucky. Busy kitties. Now, Lael would like to know who is the best hunter uh, in the pride. Now, Lael, you use the word coalition. Coalition is a what we use to refer to males. So females are a pride. And Lael would like to know is the best hunter amber eyes. I would say they're all excellent hunters, to be honest, Lael. I wouldn't say there's one that's particularly better than the other. What are you doing? Look at that. As I said, they do try to dig sometimes. And I think she's found a smaller hole a above and she's trying to sniff I said when they are hungry they, they can dig warthogs out I think I, I mean I've got such a brief view of that warthog but I think it's a male uh, which means they could possibly then it possibly be the only warthog in this hole let's just go back a little bit also no actually let's not go back a little bit because um, then we'll be directly in the line of the burrow if something does decide to come shooting out we don't want to be there maybe we can go forward but there's a fallen tree but so if we go back we'll be in the in the firing line oh, sorry Brian I can't see can I go How's that there, Brian? A little bit more? So there seems to be another burrow a bit higher up that she's digging at. Oh, I wonder if she can hear something inside there. Now, one animal that will have quite a tough time during Steph's deluge is the warthogs, because those burrows do become quite easily flooded. I watched lions in the southern Sabi sands do this for about 45 minutes, taking turns even digging, till they managed to pull a pig out of the ground. Now, the warthog might not be the only inhabitant of this, this termite mound. There could very easily be a porcupine in one of the other burrows. So, warthogs, porcupines often share. Uh, so do hyenas and porcupines, strangely enough. Costa is wondering how is the lion's sense of smell. It's, it's very good, Costa. Uh, they use their smell for all sorts of things. And uh, they probably, I think the, probably the, the, the smell of warthog is, is so heavy in that whole area that I doubt it's the smell that they're relying on here. I think they probably can hear something still in the mound. I don't know if they're going to succeed in digging that high up in the mound. Or while they're digging, the warthog decides to make a gap out of the lower hole. Well, we know on average that lions are only successful one in one and a half in ten times so we've seen two three misses so we are now that much more likely that the next one might be a success I think
think they're going to find this ground getting a little bit too hard for them to get all the way down to the pigs in this particular termite mound. Jackie J is wondering if there were baby warthogs, would they have run out with their mum? Uh, mm, probably not. They might have stayed, I think. So I think that's possibly what the the lions can hear. I said, I think there might be expending energy unnecessarily on a termite mound this size. So normally when I've seen lions dig out warthogs it's in very sandy soil, so soft sandy soils. Not so much in this, there's a bit of clay in these soils. This is fascinating behavior. Brian, have you ever seen them digging before? Nope. Nope. Well, there we go. Now, in sandy places like Botswana, they dig warthogs out quite regularly. And so I have seen it in the Sabi Sands before. Now imagine how frustrating that must be. You can hear a morsel, you can smell a morsel, and you just can't get to it. Incredible behavior. Now, Mac is asking, I said, hyenas and porcupines and pigs and porcupines often share a mound. Is it possible that warthogs and hyenas will ever share a mound? Yes, they will, Mac. I've, I've seen it quite a few times. Uh, but generally, it'll be a very big male warthog who'll put up with sharing with hyenas. And, off, and normally, if that's the case, it'll be a very small clan of hyenas. And I've seen it at, at my parents' uh, house. Uh, we actually had warthog and hyena sharing a den for quite a while. It was actually warthog, hyena, and porcupine all sharing that den. It was a particularly massive termite mound, though. It's going to be very interesting to see whether they continue to dig or they lose interest. And it looks like the one lioness has already lost interest. And they haven't made very much headway into the termite mound. I'm not sure whether they're going to give up or keep digging yet. Yeah, well, we're going to sit tight with these lines, see what happens. But while we do that, oh, let's just wait one second. What are you doing? Have you managed to get no? Okay, well we're going to sit tight, see what happens next. While we do that, uh, James has been reminiscing about Hippopotamus Day. 
Now, it is Hippopotamus Day, everybody, and I must tell you that we've had some remarkable, beautiful drawings for our competition. Of course, none of them anything like as good as my hippo drawings, uh, but uh, well, some pretty good efforts. So let's go through them. That's Lily Beal. Thank you, Lily. That's actually gorgeous. That is Mandy Rush. <laughs> Mandy, very nice. Um, that's Karen Merritt. It's, that's not her. That's a picture of a hippo that she drew. That's not what she looks like. That is Natasha Appleton, aged 28 from London. Well done, Natasha. Sharon Nobgrod. That's your hippopotamus. That hippopotamus, Sharon, has got a very large bubble butt. Uh, it looks a little bit like me when I'm walking in my shorts. I, now, not to, they're all wonderful, and as all judges of competition art go, you know, um, you have to say things like, well, it was a very difficult decision, which of course it was, because the standard of the entrance was so magnificent, and you know, some will be slightly hurt and put out, but you've all done very, very well. Who am I going to pick? Goodness gracious, it's difficult to choose. But I think that we are going to pick that one. Mandy Rush. I really like your hippopotamus. I've never seen a hippopotamus that looks like that, but that one is just very charming indeed, and a, a fine ambassador for the species hippopotamus amphibious or the uh, water horse. So thank you very much, Mandy. Rush for that. And we're going to show you a little video now about the hippopotami, and so we will see you tomorrow. Thank you very much for joining us on our drive, and we will see you tomorrow at 0530. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.